would also like to thank Jackie Rivas and Sarah Gnita, who developed this presentation in collaboration with the Center for Family Literacy and Rural Roots. This presentation was originally about a four-hour workshop and was adapted to fit into today's time slot. On the Tutela Forum, under the session's title, I have uploaded handouts from the full workshop, links referred to in the slides, and an example of diaper tags and talking tools that we'll get into, as well as follow-up contact information. I've been in the ESL field for about 20 years and have always loved literacy. Presently, as Lorraine explained, I am an ESL consultant for Rural Roots out of Norquest College in Alberta. For more information on my bio, please go to the Realize Session bio or the Rural Roots website. It has great ELL resources and a forum on it, so please check it out. Our Rural Roots website is in the links document on the Realize forum under this session. I will request a few questions at certain points during the presentation. Please type your questions into the chat box. I will read them audibly and then respond to them. I probably won't be able to read comments or questions in the chat box at the same time that I'm speaking, but I can look at them at the end of the presentation when there's time for further questions and comments. So let's go to the outcomes for today. So um, the outcomes of this session are identify some best practices when working with ESL and family literacy, understand the unique needs of ESL families, gain ideas for honoring the family's cultures and languages, gain ideas for integrating ESL families into the community, identify resources and activities that are particularly, particularly relevant for ESL family literacy. All right, so I'm going to read a scenario and I want you to imagine the feelings, fears, and challenges of the people in the scenario. Okay, you are a single mother who recently immigrated to Canada with your six children and you have limited resources to support your family. You don't speak the language, you can't read the signs, and when you try to take the bus to the grocery store, you get lost. So I would like you to look at the slide and as a family, what feelings, challenges, fears, and needs would you experience? So I'll give you a couple minutes to think about it and please write your uh, responses in the chat box. All right, so I see language challenge, uh, language challenge, isolation. Does anyone else want to share any ideas um, that this family may be experiencing, some feelings that they're having? Exactly, worry I didn't make the right choice and won't be able to get by, fear, frustration, confusion, homesick. Uh, would feel overwhelmed, not know who to turn to. Yeah, those are, are really good points here. Um, and uh, if, yeah, frustration, fear, panic. Uh, I was just going to share that I moved to Italy for a year without speaking the language. I had to get my own apartment, jobs, pay utilities, get health care, go to the market and take the subway. I relied on my dictionary. It was very stressful and I was single but most of the newcomers I know are doing all of that and raising a family. So it's a lot to handle at once. Uh, I'm going to proceed to the next slide. And this is also an imagine activity, but uh, in, now I want you to imagine you are a practitioner supporting the family that is described in the scenario. So as a practitioner, what feelings and challenges would you face? What kinds of things might you do to support the family? So please type your, uh, your responses in the chat box so I can take a look at those. So I see a feeling of desperation, probably in regards to the previous um, slide, uh, perhaps for the, to this one as well. Consistent attendance at programs may be difficult for this family. Feeling inadequate as the family needs extensive help to integrate into the community being able to provide the best kind of support and information for the family and and not be wasting their time and see if there were volunteers who would want to help mentor connect family with community services supports excellent responses here um, those are really good okay so let's go on to the next slide here uh, challenges opportunities uh, so, number one, ESL parents are somewhat isolated from the mainstream culture. Two, ESL parents may be struggling with literacy issues. 
three, challenge. ESL parents are learning a new language and strange customs. Opportunity, the chance to learn a new culture and language broadens one's horizons and opens doors. Four, training for practitioners. There just isn't much that is specific to this need. And five, adults and or children who don't want to participate. Okay, so I just want to stop here for a moment and see if there are any questions so far. So please type those in the chat box. I'll give you a, a little bit of time to think of some. Yeah, figuring out how to communicate effectively to the learner would be hard. Yes, exactly. All right, well, if there's no questions at this point, I'll just continue on. The uh, next slide that we have here, because I'm in Alberta, I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, Alberta's immigration policy. So Alberta's immigration policy is an articulation of the way we would like to live together with new immigrants to our province. Ensuring immigrants have the ability to be full participants in Alberta society will increase the likelihood that they will choose to move to and remain in the province. Welcoming communities support communities as they work towards achieving their goals for welcoming and being inclusive of immigrants and their families. For example, I am on the Welcoming Airdrie Committee, because I'm in Airdrie, Alberta. We have just developed a newcomer's manual to help those moving here. We're going to explore three principles that are important for providing a welcoming and inclusive environment for ESL families. The first one is honoring each family's culture and language. The second one is providing a meeting place where community connections can be built. And third, providing programming that meets ESL families' unique needs. Let's discuss principle one, honor each family's culture and language. One key way to ensure welcoming an inclusive environment is to honor your ESL families' cultures and languages. My dad was an immigrant from Italy, which was mentioned before by Lorraine. He was the cook in our house, so I always ate Italian food, but he didn't talk about his culture at all. My mom's dad was from Ukraine. My mom would tell me about traditions they had and taught me some Ukrainian songs. I actually went to Ukrainian Catholic Church as a child and took Ukrainian language lessons and Ukrainian dancing. My mom would make cultural dishes, pierogies, holopchi, kutia at Easter and Christmas, and we would make Ukrainian Easter eggs, pasinka. I still keep those traditions with my family. Let's go on to the next slide. Now, um, there's a slide and a song. Uh, sorry, there's a slide. And, there's a song in a book called Hello World by two different people. Please click, click on the link on your slide and listen to the song. I'll give you about three minutes to watch the video. The song is about two minutes, 20 seconds. Then please let me know you're back in the room by putting your hand up, by clicking on the hand um, on the left side of the screen or by writing in the chat box. While you listen to this song, I would like you to think about how you might use the song. How would you introduce it? What would you do during the activity? How would you follow up? What ESL families, parents, kids uh, could gain from the activity? So just think about the song in general and what you would do with it. All right, so I'll give you a few minutes to go and watch that right now, please. Hey, I'm getting some um, interesting comments here, and um, you can keep writing in there to share your ideas. Uh, and I'll just add some that we had here. So let families be the experts, knowers, teachers when it comes to how to pronounce the word hello in their own languages. Children's songs are particularly rhythmic and repetitive, great for helping adults catch the rhythm of English. Help them with some of the trouble sounds in the often repeated their pronunciation. Sing the song using greetings in other languages, especially languages of your group that were not in the song. Or create a similar song, but with different words or phrases. Goodbye, thank you, love, peace, etc. Different families could do the research. This word and then perform the song. Not only can this song or the story help parents and children with both language and literacy skills, but the content reaffirms the importance of a family's home language. 
So uh, so the slide that I have before you is using materials that honor languages. Um, one way to protect the home language is to use materials that honor um, that language and provide the information, resources, and support that families need to have a literacy rich to have literacy rich households. So uh, these particular links are on Tutela on the forum, um, but uh, they're excellent resources for you. So the first thing there is um, they give you an idea to bring in a grandparent to come in to do some oral storytelling or teach the group a song in their language. Um, use multilingual books and songs. And so when you click on that particular website, uh, it has uh, the Ryerson.ca, it has multi uh, resources for multilingual books and songs, which are very valuable. Um, and then the second part there is accessing resources for learners in their own languages. For example, they have tip sheets written in different languages um, using your first language is best to and to talk to your baby in your own language. Um, so that's another resource that we have listed there. And then there's actually how-to videos for newcomers and their kids in different languages. Uh, so I actually clicked on there and they have a video on how to teach your children uh, how to bake with you, uh, and they have that in different languages so that the child has numeracy skills and literacy skills uh, used in that particular activity. So those are really, really good resources uh, to use. So uh, we'll go on to the next slide. If we have time at the end, um, you can click on those and add your comments for me, please. So. Uh, Learning about your ELL family shows you honor their culture and language and provides an important foundation for everything you do in your programming. Even basic information about families' ethnic and linguistic backgrounds or the situations from which they have come can help you match families with appropriate services and programs. Build rapport by showing a genuine interest in your learners. John Maxwell says, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care, and it's very, very true. So in this slide, it says, what would be important for you to know or learn about your ELL families? So please, I'll give you a, a minute or so to uh, type into the chat box um, your comments about that. So I'm seeing some comments here. Their names, children's names, family situation, cultural background, background, family makeup, culture, traditions, how they're adapting to life in Canada. Yeah, which days are important celebrations in their culture and how they celebrate them. Language barriers that they are encountering exactly. Um, these are really good comments here. In the handout that is attached to the forum, there are uh, there's an actual, it's kind of like a, a form that you can fill in with different information about the family to get a better understanding of your particular family. All right, I think I'll go on to the next slide then. So, um, and the the uh, roles that I'm discussing are also on the Tutela forum. So, uh, principle two is provide a meeting place where community connections can be built. So, when working with ELL families, you are more than a family literacy practitioner. You also have a key role to play in facilitating inclusion and belonging in your community, a role that might not be necessary with non-ELL families. You're also a community connector. As a member of your community, you have access to an understanding of a host of community services. So as a community connector, you can, one, provide opportunities for community members and newcomers to have positive and meaningful interactions. Two, be knowledgeable of local, provincial, and federal resources for newcomers. Three, be knowledgeable of aspects of the Canadian system, for example, healthcare, um, beyond your personal experience. So personally, I encourage my learners to share cheap places to buy things, which schools are good, they can discuss jobs they saw posted, or good doctors and dentists. They then form their own mini community to help each other out and create a sense of belonging. And they have found that really beneficial for them. All right, so let's go to the next slide. And this is your role as a practitioner. So you might not be aware of this, but um, as a language or literacy practitioner, you are actually a cultural bridge between um, the ELL and the community. On the next slide, we talk a little bit more about what a cultural bridge is. So let's take a look at that next slide. 
and what is a cultural bridge? A person who mediates the cultural distance between learners and community members and uses bridging processes to facilitate a shift in perspective when exploring the cultural perspectives of different groups. So as a cultural bridge, just like you can see in the picture there, um, first ask, assess or recognize the level of cultural distance. For example, how different they are culturally from the community around them. Be informed and provide cultural uh, information lens beyond personal experience and notice and make sense of learner behavior without judgment. Are there any questions at this point? No, we're good. Okay, so let's go on to the next slide, please. Communities feel many positive impacts from family literacy programs in general. So if we look at this quote, it says, engaged and educated citizens are better prepared to practice healthy lifestyles, improve economic security, actively contribute to their communities, and build success from one generation to the next. Okay, and let's go on to the next slide, which is principle three. So principle three, uh, provide programming that meets the particular language and cultural needs of the ESL families. So in contrast to other families, ESL families have certain needs. They may need help understanding what is going on. They may need more encouragement and assistance than others to participate. They will benefit from activities that help them learn the language. All right, so the next slide has some um, practical suggestions and ideas here. The first one is to help learners uh, make sense of what is going on. And you'll also find these um, on Tutela on the forum. So one, speak slowly and clearly. Number two, be sure that directions are clear. Have a learner volunteer to explain the directions you just gave. Number three, use visuals, realia, uh, actions, and hands-on demonstrations to help them understand, demonstrate. Four, use the board flip chart paper. Write out things like directions, keywords, song lyrics, or record new vocabulary as you speak. Five, be mindful that your ELL parents did not grow up here and may have unexpected gaps or differences in knowledge, skills, attitudes, and assumptions. Are there any questions on those um, five ideas that I just gave? No, everybody's happy, good, okay. So let's go on to the next slide, number two. Encourage and facilitate participation, and these are also in the handle. So, number one, give them extra time to formulate answers to questions. When I studied for my Bachelor of Education degree, one of the key elements of research showed that teachers wait something like, I think it was three seconds for a response, when they need to handle the silence and wait at least 30 seconds to a minute to get creative answers. ELLs need time to think and formulate how to say what they are going to say. There's translation that's going on in, in the head. Um, ask a question and wait longer, then may be comfortable for an answer. It's the instructor that has the uncomfortableness uh, mainly when they're waiting for an answer. Uh, ELLs may not show they are thinking in the way we are used to. They may silently think of their answer rather than saying, mm, let me think, which we often do. Number two, avoid the temptation to keep repeating or rephrasing the question. When you do rephrase, be sure to use simpler rather than more complex language. If they have trouble jumping into the conversation, you may need to nominate ELLs and help them get turns to talk. That is, they may not signal they want to talk in the same way we do in Canada, and they may expect a few seconds of silence between turns while we tend to jump into conversations with no breaks. Next one, you can go around and give each person a chance to speak with the freedom to pass if they are uncomfortable. And I think that's key. You need to give them that, um, that freedom to pass. Number three, allow ELLs to watch and listen if they don't feel comfortable participating. Many learners go through a silent period, and this is good to know. This watching and listening period is important. They are working on receptive, not productive skills. But if they are silent because they don't know how to jump in, they may need encouragement. So use that opportunity to show them how to jump into a conversation. Number four, 
Include some activities that require fewer English language skills. Wordless picture books are excellent um, books in their languages. Number five, be mindful that if your ELL parents may have unexpected be mindful that your ELL parents may have unexpected skills and knowledge. Whenever possible, allow them to take the role of knower or expert. And it's particularly important that their children see them in this role periodically. All right, so let's turn to the next slide, please. And again, these hints are in the handouts. So, one, select rhythmic and repetitive materials, songs, chants, rhymes, children's stories. They help learners absorb the rhythm of English help them be able to predict what will come next. They reinforce vocabulary and give opportunity to practice problem sounds. Two, help ELLs with pronunciation of problem sounds, especially in words that are repeated over and over in books or songs. Break words into syllables, but avoid correcting their grammar or pronunciation in general in front of the group and specifically in front of their children. Three, Teach keywords prior to covering a theme. Discuss the theme first, write vocabulary down, highlight them when they pop in, up in songs or stories, explain what they mean, and validate a learner attempting to use the word. Four, give learners opportunity to use their oral language skills. Listening and following directions is valuable. Listening and making sense of what is said is valuable expressing their ideas, answering questions, participating in a discussion, discussion, repeating quarterly, all of these may represent success for your ELL parent. Of course, opportunities to read and write are also valuable. On the next slide, I have some don'ts. These are in the handouts as well. They're very important. One, don't correct grammar and pronunciation errors in front of the group or their children although some students may want you to. It's okay to clarify communication, but correction can be humiliating. Two, don't over-enunciate. When you teach an ELL how to say a word or phrase, try to say it as you would normally say it in speech, because then it will be recognizable later to the learner. Number three, don't change your rhythm. For example, speaking word by word when speaking. Possible to speak slowly while still maintaining a natural rhythm, and do not speak in broken English. For example, yes, many games to play, instead of saying, there are many games to play. That really irritates me when instructors do that. Okay, um, and actually I was thinking about uh, number two when I'm talking about over-enunciating. Uh, there was a Chinese person who wasn't sure where to catch a bus, and uh, asked, uh, you know, a Canadian-born person, and this Canadian-born person started yelling at them with the same instructions because they thought if they speak louder, uh, then they'll catch on to what they're supposed to be doing, and uh, as if yelling will help. So please, uh, you know, be aware of that. All right, let's go on to the next slide, which has some sample activities. Okay, so we have keywords and songs rhymes. And these are also in the handout. So the first thing is keywords. Discuss keywords related to a theme. For example, traditions. Display them and refer back to them during the discussion and other activities. These words can be laminated. Use them in bingo games, charades, concentration. I wrote a whole workshop on ESL games for rural groups. Um, and ELLs gain a broader vocabulary and increased understanding of the session. Number two, songs and rhymes. Select songs rhymes with a lot of repetition that are related to a theme you are covering. Choose songs that play with language and make use of repeated sounds. Write out the lyrics to the song and highlight keywords. Use the keywords during and post song story. For example, I assigned each student one little cutout animal to hold up when they heard that animal's name mentioned in an animal's song or story. Students could also have realia in front of them and hold those up when they are mentioned in a story. Uh, and those items could then be hid in the room so they have to find them and tell where they found them, or they could be placed in a box and have two teams do a relay race to find them as the instructor calls them out. The possibilities are endless. ELLs gain improved pronunciation and rhythm, vocabulary, confidence, and skills for en engaging their children when they use songs and rhymes. 
All right. Are there any questions at this point? So I'll discuss four here. Diaper tags, shared reading, family story pack, and talking tools. So the first one, and these are in the handouts as well on the Tutelo forum. So diaper tags. Uh, you can print out and laminate song and rhyme lyrics on cards that can be attached to a diaper bag. The goal is that parents can pull these out when their children are getting restless. So say a parent's at a doctor's office and the child is acting up. Um, they can pull out these little diaper tags, which are basically a nursery rhyme that's laminated with a hole in it um, to attach to a diaper bag. And the parent can use that particular time to, uh, to sing the song with the child. And uh, it's amazing how the child will um, be engaged in that. So ELLs gain opportunities to review new words and vocabulary strategies for engaging their children by using the diaper tags. And there's a sample on the Tetella forum for you. Number two, shared reading. With repetitive books, read the book aloud and have the group join in on the repeated parts. Or read one sentence and have the group read the next. Or read the narration and have the group read one character's part. Be creative. The family could then go home and make a puppet show or drama of it. And by doing the shared reading, ELLs gain confidence to participate, reading practice, rhythm practice, speaking intonation, and expression. Third area here, activity, is family story pack. You can create a package including a book in English and another language along with props related to the book. The props are there to help parents engage their children, but they also provide vocabulary development for the parents. For example, The Very Hungry Caterpillar. You can find the book in English, and it could be in Arabic. You could have a stuffed caterpillar and some basic um, and some pieces of plastic fruit. By doing a family story pack, ELLs gain increased vocabulary and reading skills, affirmation of their home language, and strategies for engaging their children. Four, talking tools. You can find these on the Tetella forum as well. Um, so for example, there's a talking tool which is kind of like, um, well, it's, it's an aid, and it's per, just imagine it's on a cue card. And so it, one talking tool says, Talk about what you are doing, okay? So that's to remind a parent of what um, what they can do to help their children with literacy. These are tips for parents to foster interaction and engagement with their children. In Lifelong Learning in Grand Prairie, family literacy practitioners highlight one talking tool each session. They will talk about it, post it, and have parents practice using it throughout the session, for example, during the craft. Parents are then encouraged to try this out throughout the week. In the next session, parents are asked, did anyone try that last week? Give an example of what you did. So by using the talking tools, which you can copy um, from the, uh, the forum, um, ELLs gain parenting skills, particularly important for refugees who may have had limited parenting themselves, and also insight into Canadian ways of interacting, which may be very different from their own home cultures. All right, I'll pause here for any questions that anyone has. I think we're good to go. Okay, let's go on to the next slide, which is a review. Um, what I'd like you to do is to please share one strategy or activity you intend to try out in your family literacy group. So we dis discussed quite a few, uh, but are there any that particularly stand out in your head and you're like eager to try them out? If so, please uh, share it with us in the chat box. I'm reading. I want to try the Hello Song with a number of activities. Yeah, it's great. And once you actually get into an activity, you will see your ideas flow, right? So it just comes with um, actually attempting it, and then your mind engages, and, and you can come up with so many different ideas. And every time you do it, you'll actually come up with different ideas and test those out, so I encourage you to do that. I'm reading here, I agree the learners will likely lead where we go to, right? And you want to do that. You want to you wanna be um, student-centered, not teacher-centered. How old are the children in your group? Uh, I have a preschool. It's called Rhymes That Bind program through Rocky View Schools, and it's uh, actually called Tales and Tunes. And those are zero to five-year-olds.
Okay, and Joanne writes, I don't actually lead a family literacy group, but we'll pass on some of these ideas to the daycare provider at our settlement agent. Great. The family story packs seem great. Yes, they they are great. Uh, yeah, zero to five. That's right. Yeah, zero to five-year-olds. And then I read by Jane writes, I teach slightly higher levels, but we'll share some of the resources in their own languages that were on the slide with several links. Great. Yeah, once you go through the handouts, you'll see um, you'll see a variety of different resources in there that are really helpful as well. Like I said, there's um, a sample of the diaper tags, and then there's the talking tools, uh, which are great. Nikki, what practical tips would you share in terms of promoting family literacy at learners' home in general while parents are still working on building their literacy and language skills, especially for those who are non-literate in their first language? Yeah, in general, I would suggest that um, parents have, they just generally have books and um, different forms of uh, resources so that they can engage their children. So even if the parent isn't literate in their first language, they can still have books around for their children to look at, to look at the pictures. That's what's especially important um, with them, I would say, is using wordless books. Uh, and there are a variety of wordless books around, which obviously you can use in any language. Oh, yeah, and so <laughs> Betty writes their wordless picture books are great for that, and they really, really are. Um, do you have activities that appeal to all the children in your group? I find it hard to find activities that appeal to them all in the same time. Yeah, that's a good point. And so whenever you're um, thinking of activities or lesson plans, you should try to imagine, uh, well, not to imagine, to realize that there's different um, learning styles, right? And so uh, try to use different learning styles for the different children. And so maybe in one lesson, um, you know, one learning style would be engaged more in the activity than others, but they need to be exposed to different ways of learning, uh, whether or not that's their particular um, learning style. So Gavin. Hi, Gavin. Gavin writes here, the great thing about working with kids and their parents is if you can get the parents involved in repetition and song and play, the early age literacy materials rub off without worrying of appropriate maturity level. Yeah, exactly, Gavin. That's a really good point. The higher the emotional quotient, the higher the retention. Yeah, and that's why you'll see that you, if you start using rhymes and songs and stories, especially that have an emotional component to them, um, the children get so involved, the parents get involved, and uh, when that emotional quotient is, is up, it's true that the retention is there. That is so true, Stella Wright. So I'm practicing giving lots of response time. Not that you're ELLs, but it's, uh, it's a good practice uh, when you're working with anyone. The families I deal with on kind of a Disney idea, the kids play, and the focus of the movie is for the adults. Hey, Gavin, I'm not understanding what you're meaning by that. And since I know you, I can ask you to clarify. Meaning very focused lessons that the adult learners have clear takeaways, but the kids don't even know this. Okay, yeah, no, now I get what you're saying. All right, so I would like you to please remember the three principles discussed today, which is one, honor each family's culture and language, two, provide a meeting place where community connections are built, and three, provide programming that meets the particular language and cultural needs of ESL families. So um, questions or comments, would just like to invite you to um, add any of those right now. So let's see, Joanne writes, our students who have children in the daycare are often invited to participate when someone from the library comes in to read to the kids. They seem to enjoy it. Yeah, that's great. Good comment there. Oh, um, there's a question here. What trainings do you recommend for practitioners to have in order to run an ESL family literacy program effectively? Uh, I can't speak to a national basis, but I know that in Alberta here we have um, foundations in family literacy. 
Uh, I've taken that. I've also taken Story Sucks, which is great. It teaches about the uh, the family pack, about the books. Um, and then we have um, Rhymes That Bind. That's another program. We also have Books, B-O-O-K-S. Uh, and then we have... Um, I'm trying to remember all of the other ones that I've taken. They have uh, the Center for Family Literacy here in Alberta offers a number of excellent courses, and um, I'm not sure, uh, like I said, provincially what is available in your province. But if you probably contact uh, the literacy organization within your province, they would have great ideas for you to follow up on that, uh, or like if you have a, a, fam a Center for Family Literacy. Lorraine, would you mind sharing those into Tella later, Louisa? Yeah, that's a good idea. Thanks, Lorraine. All right, so Lorraine, uh, I have till 2.15, is that right? Yes. Okay, uh, Gavin, mainstream early childhood education courses or even day home practitioner courses are full of ideas that can be translated into ESL also. Yeah, that's true, Gavin. Betty writes, look for a partner in your local literacy organization. Yeah. And uh, Nikki, uh, that will also motivate the parents to build stronger oral cultural competencies in the program. Exactly. And so you want to hit the family, right? So uh, if you have the parents involved, their literacy skills increase, um, and then they set an example, they model it for their children, and the children um, also who become interested in uh, in reading and in, in storytelling, etc., they will uh, model it for their parents. And, and because it's exciting for them, uh, then the parents get excited as well. So it's it's a win-win situation for everyone. All right, so if there's no further questions here, let's see. Betty writes, public libraries also often have specialists in early childhood and family literacy. Yeah, that's an excellent point. So libraries have very, very good um, family literacy programs, uh, and, uh, and I would encourage the... ELLs to bring their children to those library staff in the children's area. Jane writes could probably recommend a great many great many wordless picture books that parents could use as bedtime. Yeah, and they learn early literacy skills like reading a book from front to back. Uh, Rosie's Walk. Okay, so Rosie's Walk. There's a resource for you right there. Um, and then uh, Gavin, many libraries run programs that work on a family-lit basis as well as a supplement. To introduce those programs. Yes, and some libraries actually offer ESL um, specified uh, programs for literacy. So you can check those out. Yes, let's plug that in there. Next week is Family Literacy Week. Thanks, Lorraine. Gavin, uh, through the use of their own photos, create wordless books. Yes, that's a good idea. Connects on a personal basis and can be labeled later. Yeah, get the kids to do that. That's, that's an excellent activity. Um, and it can be a family activity, right? And it promotes literacy skills. So those are excellent comments there. Thank you so much. Um, I want to thank you for what you do, which is the next slide. And uh, I want, oh, sorry, the references and resources are there. And, uh, and if we go to the final slide, thank you for what you do um, and uh, for participating in this presentation. I hope you have a great weekend. And for follow-up contact information, uh, please go on the Tutela forum, and I have a, uh, a document there for contact um, follow-up um, information on there. So uh, if there's any further questions, please uh, post those right now, and uh, you can continue it on the Tutela forum. Thank you so much. Okay, well, we do have time for a few more questions, if anyone has any. But in the meantime, I'll just give a very big thank you to Louisa for her presentation, and thank you all for participating. And as Louisa said, you're encouraged to join the Realize Group on Tutela to continue the discussion and to consult uh, the resources that she has shared.